Yeah, it's, the problem is, is with collecting, and this is, I guess, this is where we'll start tonight. Is you know that we had the issue, I guess, in the, the thing about um, the ninety dollar value, right? For um, oh yeah, right, right. And the first at, three box bunker drama. Right, and I mean it really ain't much of a drama, but the the key I think that people always have to remember, and I always. I don't do a lot of boxes this way with value because of this problem. Yep. Value is subjective. Yep. Like I had somebody cancel a subscription today that was saying that $20 was overpriced. That's um, crazy. I'm like, okay, so, you know, what is the minimum you pay for an autograph? Like would pay for an autograph for anybody, you know what I mean? Like just the photo alone, the protector, I've got to pay the actor, you know, overhead. I mean... For a truly, like, a real authentic autograph for 20 bucks, no matter who it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you can't do that. Like, even, I mean, even if you're a street grapher. Right. $20 you're going to lose in time and... Hanging uh, out for two or three hours in the weather. Yeah. Like, $20 is nothing. And then all those times you go out and don't get anything? Exactly. You know, um... But see, that's, that's the thing with these boxes. The and then you have these boxes. Like right now, I'm looking at the OC box, right? The the Batman one. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to spoil it, but I mean, anybody can go and Google what OC's done in the past and know what's going to be in the box. <laughs> I mean, you have to. You would know based on who the they've repped in the past. The the logo, the which Batman logo it is, and right. who's worth two hundred dollars. Well, I mean, you know, well, that, I mean, they've only worked with one Batman. And they've worked with one Joker. And yeah. they've worked with, you know. So, I mean, like I said, it's, uh, it, it doesn't take a lot of, I guess, internet sleuthing. And again, that's fine. Right? Yeah. But this is why, again, I try not to do boxes like that yeah. or value. Because, again, let's say, let's take Stephen Amell, right? Okay. I sell his autograph like 80 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. To some people, that's way overpriced. And to some people, that's a steal, right? Because, you know, mine is his first generation autograph, which is his full signature and not the yeah. SA, right? And again, it's and somebody, some people wouldn't even pay 20 bucks or even 10 bucks for that autograph. Yeah. Right? So when, when you're opening boxes or when you're doing the value of stuff, right? You gotta also open it with that and and state stuff that, in my opinion, to me, for what I collect and what I'm into, this is not worth this amount of money, mm -hmm. right? And I think the problem is, is a lot of people like they they rate stuff based on again their own biases, right? Like sometimes I get messages like, "Oh, I don't know any of these people," I'm like. Okay, well, I don't know who you know or what you watch or how you watch, you know what I mean? And that's why I pretty much work with and do stuff with people that I'm a fan of, if I've watched their stuff or I've enjoyed their stuff. Yeah. Right? Um, because to me, that's what it's about. And I'm guessing based on, you know, my years and years of experience and the people that follow me, they like the same stuff that I like for the most part. You know what I mean? Um, Absolutely. It's, I mean, look at all of the variety of stuff that you collect pop-wise, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I watched your video, I think, um, the one about the, the Dragon Ball Z unboxing, right? Oh, yeah. If you go through the last 15 years of Dragon Ball Z, it's popular again. But there was about 10 years where if you admitted you liked Dragon Ball Z, everybody laughed at you. That was when I was when I was growing up. Everybody thought it was so silly. Anime was stupid. How dare you watch anime? You know that I I went through that phase in '99. Dragon Ball Z it. was pretty big, but you can only get them in the U.S. on VHS. Uh, this was about when Funimation started adding them uh, on uh, Cartoon Network. Yeah, and they had the VHS copies. And it wasn't for a few years later that they started doing them on DVD. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, and 
it's funny because like in 2000, 2001, I'd say maybe about 2002, I started anime.net. Right, which was a <laughs> database, but basically this was pre Wikipedia type of stuff. How many websites do you own? Oh, it's, this is the problem. Is especially during downtimes when I'm just bored, like when I'm waiting for signatures or when I'm waiting to make the next deal, I sit there and I come up with another idea. Like you know, we were talking <laughs> about like the V shouts and the cameo. Like I can go yeah. back ten years and show you the website that I registered, and even the promo videos that I filmed with Eric Milligan talking about okay. doing V shouts or cameos with him, you know, for a certain amount of money, you know, watch it's us, so you know, like in the same thing with the virtual cons, which is everything. Now I, I used to own like virtual uh, cons dot, con, uh, dot events, you know, and <laughs> I went to, again, it's just, the problem is, is I get to the, to the final stage of planning and I'm like, Oh yeah, this is going to cost me a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> But back to the anime.net thing, right? Okay. Um, so this was like when anime was still a thing. The only way to really watch it was to bootleg it, you know, off of torrent sites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those were all, you know, you'd have to wait, you know, for them to come out with the subtitles on the dubs. So like, you know, uh, because you could get them, but they would have the subtitles. Yeah. Right? So you there was groups that would subtitle them and throw them up on torrents and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is, is you just never could get a good source for like what series was on what episode or what, what series ran how many episodes in Japan. Because again, by the time stuff got to the U S back then, it had already been on air for like five or 10 years in Japan. Yeah. And, um, and so I created that and I, at that database and I went to the New York anime like convention and talked with a lot of voice actors I actually went out and uh, had dinner with the woman who played uh, voices Ash you know oh, okay yeah, yeah, yeah right and we had dinner you know uh, after the convention and um, just talked and you know again Nothing ever happened with it. I just kind of put it aside. But it was like my first business. I even like registered it in New York. And I even found like one of my business cards, you know, and, I, and like the yeah. the registration from the New York, you know, sales tax and all that kind of stuff. And uh, but again, this was back when anime was just, you know. A... So somewhere in my somewhere in my garage, I have um, there was a famous bootleg dragon ball set because like you said you know by the time the dragon ball started making it here basically in japan it was done right so they had gone through dragon ball z gt all in japan already right so i have in the garage somewhere this bootleg it's like i it, it's a bunch of those thick cd cases mm-hmm and they made artwork and everything so that the the edge of it is a full mural right. across the whole way. And you've probably seen them. Yeah, they there was like a the really cool website back then. Like, and it's all uh, subtitled, yeah. Dragon Ball, and that's how I watch it. So the funny thing is, I talk to my friends all the time. I struggle. Like, I have a whole bunch of Dragon Ball stuff pop signed by the American voice actors. Because right. that's cool. And they're at every I, single convention I can't every week. Watch it. They don't sound right. Yeah. Like, the American voice actors for Dragon Ball don't sound right to me. Well, the but thing then is... you've got My Hero Academia, which is being dubbed at the same time as it's being... Released. Filmed. Yeah. Or produced. And so I'm fine watching that in English. But I can't watch Dragon Ball in English. I have to watch Dragon Ball in Japanese. Well, uh, one thing that I have that's pretty unique is I have a bunch of original anime art cells that were used in the production of Dragon Ball Z. That's cool. And uh, I actually got to meet Akira Toriyama at the Shogun Jump premiere in New York. He actually flew down for like Shogun Jump magazine is you know was the magazine that uh, the Mongos uh, first appeared in before they become anime. Yeah. And they were releasing the the U.S. version 
And uh, so I went and I got the, the Kira Toriyama art book and I was hoping to get him to sign it, but he wasn't signing stuff. But at least I got to, to meet him. But I have, um, for example, the original cell background, all of the layers of um, Gohan on the Kai planet with the Kai earring. That's cool. We're holding the sword like this. And then I have a few more. And then I even have a Dr. Slump. Uh, anime art self from when he uh, was the show before Dragon Ball. That he That's did. really cool. Um, so, I mean, I, I've collected a lot of different things over the years. But, again, it's all Eye of the Beholder type of stuff, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I have some stuff that people will be like, why does that even matter? Like, uh, we talked about it before, one of the autographs I got from you, you got you got people giving you flack, and you then you have me going, this is like a grail. Like, Right. This is the coolest autograph. I never thought I'd own it. <laughs> well, that was true. I mean, even, you know, we won't talk about it much, but one of your unboxing videos, you know, you were talking about, I don't even want to say it, but it was like the show. You didn't watch it, but about four or five people commented it was one of their favorite shows of all times. The last, in the last autograph of the month club? Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, exactly. So the funny thing, the funny thing about it is I told you this and I won't tell anybody because I don't want to spoil that one yet, but. I had four people reach out to me saying, this was the greatest show ever. Don't watch it. Right. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're like, they're going to be disappointed. Well, I was talking. In the same position they are. One of the things I was talking to about with the actor was uh, when we were doing the signing was um, about starting a petition to do a movie to, to wrap kind things Kind of like up. the way Firefly, Serenity. Yeah, it's same with like Deadwood and stuff like yeah. that. But, uh, so yeah, anyways, that's what I wanted to talk a little bit, you know, touch base on the idea of collecting and how personal it is and how value is so subjective. Absolutely. I mean, that's again why I can't put together these boxes uh, of stuff and, and promise a certain value, right? Because whose value am I promising, right? So I can give like a little little story from this week and it's going to be in a future video, but if the five people who are here watching now can get a little spoiler for a future video. Uh, we made a pretty big trade this last week. Um, we traded five, five autographs, um, three of which were Game of Thrones. And honestly, these autographs to some people, like one of them was Nikolai Colster or whatever his name is. Um, right. They're not cheap. Like that one goes for, you know, 50 to 70 dollars um we traded five autographs that for us would sit in a book right in one of the books and we traded them for a 11 by 14 signed by will smith from the movie ollie nice and so that's the whole thing and kendall and i actually had a huge conversation about it recently so bringing it up we decided that we're going to start really narrowing our collection into because if we just keep up at the rate that we're at we're going to have shelves full of itoyas filled with autographs that we go through once every three months right and i want to have these items that like so for me personally you know everybody's got their own opinion i think that ollie is will smith's greatest movie of all time the way that he portrayed Muhammad Ali is the same level as the way Adam Sandler portrayed Andy Kaufman. I mean, he became Muhammad Ali. Right. Yeah, which is funny because uh, if you see the pictures of Jamie Foxx as Mike Tyson. I have not seen. I didn't know. That he he's been working on Fox. almost a Mike Tyson uh, thing for about 10 years now. But he's, like, that. bulked up huge. And That's funny because Jamie Foxx is in that movie, and Jamie Foxx's character in that movie is another incredible acting job. Right. And so I just this was about, I would say, about three weeks or a month ago that they started showing photos of him bulked up for Mike, for the Mike Tyson pick. I'll have to look into that. But, uh, all know, right. The things that these actors do, like, uh, you know, Pat was talking about it um, last week, the research and just being a bartender at a bar that he was filming at, you know, right. and the the research and 
when they actually transform themselves into a character. That's why, like, um, probably my favorite actor right now, hands down, is Evan Peters. Um, right. And if you watch, like, I don't know if you watch American Horror Story. Yeah, I've watched it on and off. His, in cult, how many different serial cult killer, cult leader killers that he portrayed, it was insane right. what he was able to do. No, I mean, there's just some actors that are like that. I mean, look what, um, in Split, you know, all of the different personalities. Oh, that, that, one of the best acting jobs, that, that scene in Split where he is in the psychiatrist's office and he literally changes his face while he's looking up yeah just yeah. insane there's yeah. a couple other actors and other shows that, that have been like that too I mean look at Orphan Black with uh, was it Tatiana Malise or something like that you know yeah um, alright speaking of which I, I promise you and oh man we were at six we were but, at six. I, I apparently don't like Evan Peters. So I promised you a special clip. So okay. back during Comic Con, I think it was either two thousand nine or ten. They uh, Zachary Levi did a his own little convention outside of the convention, <laughs> and they ran this sixty second movie film competition, right? Okay. Well, I did some film editing and some film video stuff in high school. And to me, I, I'm a creative person, but um, but it's more towards business, creative ideas, you know? But every once okay. in a while, I have to flex that creative muscle. So I'm like, it was like four days before the deadline. And it was like a Friday. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to enter the 60-second film competition. I'm going to do... I'm, I'm living in Manhattan. I'm a couple blocks from Central Park. I'm going to do a 60-second love story in Central Park and make it okay. geek-themed, right? And I'm going to tell the whole story in 60 seconds. And then I started thinking, okay, well, that's one idea, right? And then I'm like, well, at this time, too, I was, again, big into Firefly and brown coats, and the brown coat balls were every year, you know, all over the U.S., yeah. And a friend of mine, she had the dress from Kaylee's, from the ball, Kaylee's okay. dress. So I'm like, you know what? I want, let's do my date with Kaylee <laughs> and have her come out and dress up. And we're going to do all of the cliche, romantic, Central Park things. And basically we spent, I, I filmed, edited, and did this whole thing in four hours. Okay. And uh, we're going to have the world... Pre I've always kept it, like, private. You know, I've always showed it, like, to people and stuff. But I'm going to go ahead and we're going to... This is the world premiere. World premiere on the autograph. Oh, we got there. Another view. Ready? And go. tell you, you mean the world to me, and I love you so much. Today has been the most wonderful day of my life. Oh, I love you too. Marco! Marco! I love you. Man, you fell asleep watching Firefly again. That's awesome. So yeah, I did that whole thing, the filming, the video, the editing, and I was done four hours. That's great, man. That's so funny. <laughs> so yeah, everybody, that was for you guys. Now, you see me here first, Marco with a with a baby beard. 
Yeah, the baby beard. But, uh... <laughs> so, yeah, uh, that was always autograph, watching. That autograph dude enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun yeah. making it. I was bummed it did not make the top three. And what was worse, the top three I didn't even like. So, you know. How did that not win? I don't know, right? All the heart and passion... Maybe and they weren't Firefly fans. And they're like, "What is this?" Date with Kaylee, right? But uh, yeah, that was that was uh, a friend of mine, and we used to go to the brown coat balls and stuff, you know. Uh, and that was always a lot of fun. If you ever get a chance to to go to one, yeah, uh, I know. I think there's what they, they they've done Portland a couple times. I think. Oh yeah, and that's fandoms hit Portland all the time because yeah. you know it's Portland. They have the Doctor but, Who bar and everything. Who know? Like uh, when we went to um, Rose City Comic Con last year, they had the the Wizard Ball, which was a lot of. Uh, it was like all you can drink alcohol samples. <laughs> Sorry, I was just laughing into the comments. Oh yeah. But uh, <laughs> so. But it was all you can drink samples or whatever. Yeah, it was like all you can drink, but it was uh, you had to keep getting in line to get samples. It was kind of interesting, um, and it was Harry Potter themed, but it was just basically a bunch of Comic Con people getting smashed. Nice. All right, so in the bunker, the mystery box bunker. Yes. Uh, I created a poll this week, um, and it's basically almost fifty-fifty. You know, I think at the end, a couple people chimed in. Um, but is Supernatural a subgenre sub genre of horror, or is it a completely separate category? It gets further than that. Because there is a subgenre of horror, which is Supernatural horror. Right. But Supernatural can be on its own and not be horror. Right. And I think that was the consensus at the end. But yeah. uh, so, like, let's throw out some examples, right? Like Ghostbusters. Yeah, Ghostbusters is not horror. Now, the funny thing is, you think about movies that but, were just supernatural movies that be that were actually scary. And I don't know that they actually necessarily meant to be as terrifying as they were. Well, I mean, Ghostbusters is actually kind of terrifying in a bit, in a sense. You know what I mean? It's not, I mean, as a kid or something, I mean, it's... You know, I mean, like, there's some pretty dark scenes in that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the question is, is what makes a horror movie a horror movie? And to me, is if somebody's chasing you to kill you, <laughs> then I think that has to be a horror movie, right? So were the ghosts and Ghostbusters trying to kill people, though? Because did anybody in Ghostbusters ever actually die? I don't know. I don't <laughs> know. But, I mean, they were trying to open the gates of hell, weren't they? I mean... That would have <laughs> unleashed some some casualties. That's the real the real question out there to the people that are here right now and the people that'll watch us later is what was the kill count in Ghostbusters and Ghostbusters Two? I mean, I mean, it's definitely no Rambo. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're not you're not racking them up like Jason over here. Right. So yeah. let's start throwing out some other movies like right, like what about The Conjuring? So Conjuring straight horror though. Straight horror, but not supernatural? Or is it straight... No, it's I mean, supernatural horror, but... Right. So, like, for, for me, one that comes to mind that I think really tears is Signs. Right. I don't consider so, that one horror at all, though. Was, yeah, was Signs supposed to be a horror movie? Because it was It scary. was science fiction. It's one of the scariest movies I've ever seen. Right, but Aliens is... I see, Aliens, too. That's science fiction, but that's... But yeah, it was see, supernatural also. See, and I was a fan of science. Also talked about God and religion. And right. so signs is one of those ones that really just breaks down all of that. Well, see, to so, me, signs was one of the best movies as far as audio goes to see in a movie theater. Oh, absolutely. The way, like, you hear the stuff go, and you hear it over your head behind you to your left and not ever see anything. And see, to me, I like suspenseful horror. 
to me, I'm, I'm not a slasher person or what they call torture porn. You know, like a lot of the Saw movies. I like the original Saw movie. The no budget where they just shook the camera. <laughs> right, but I mean, it, it had a really good story. And then the rest of them, to me, was just basic torture porn. You know what I mean? It got, yeah, progressively each time it got worse and worse and worse um, into we have money, we can actually show what somebody getting filleted looks like now. Right. And the same thing with like the Friday the 13th and uh, that first one to me was not a slasher in a, in a sense. You know what I mean? Like in the same thing with um, Nightmare on Elm Street, like the first ones were always kind of serious and the rest of them turned to comedy. Yeah. Well, the perfect, the perfect example of that is, and Kendall actually just watched this for the first time. I finally got her to sit down and watch it. We just watched uh, Scream. She had never seen it before. Classic. And that's the perfect example. Scream started out as a serious horror movie and then started making fun of itself. Right. And it even created that whole stab uh, fake movie. Um, well, see, I think now- I think the you you have to give the uh, Wayans brothers credit for a lot of those fake movies before they became popular. Oh yeah, well the Wayans brothers was a scary movie. That was one of the most brilliant spoof movies ever made. And it was funny because Kendall had seen Scary Movie, but she'd never seen Scream. Right. And she actually said she struggled watching Scream because she kept remembering the scenes from Scary Movie. Right. And so it would make it less serious. Well, it's like reading a book and then watching the movie adaptation. The first time you watch it, it's like Harry Potter, yeah. right? The first time you're watching it, all you can think of, this wasn't in the book, or they did this differently, or they swapped this around. and uh, and then, But then if you go back and watch it a second time with you kind of don't do that as much and you can actually enjoy it a little bit better yeah Um, i just i so i'm watching like i'm watching scream and i'm like i'm watching it from these eyes of man Wes craven really did a great job to bring the horror genre back to life you know that's what this movie did this movie brought horror back to the mainstream so what would you say is one of the all-time best horror movies all-time best horror okay so my favorite horror movie of all time is the first strangers first strangers the strangers uh, the first, I, the oh, strangers oh the first okay it's the movie strangers but the first one the first one the mm-hmm. second one was kind of a, it was kind of a, for for as long as i had to wait for a sequel it was okay it just being somebody who has been in a form of law enforcement since 2005, right. that was the most realistic horror movie I've ever seen in my life. So I've never seen it. Oh, you've never seen it? Well, I, again, I'm not really big on horror. Like, it's yeah. this is what, like I said, kind it's of separates not, me, you know, from the gory. other. It's not, um, I don't want to spoil it for you, but just, it's very... It could happen to anybody. Right. That's the point of that movie. See, to me, it my is. my favorite horror horror movies, I guess, is more suspense, like Hitchcock style stuff. That's a you know. So like, you want to talk? You talk about that? The my my personal who I think right now, and you might not consider his movies actually horror. Um, Ari Aster, uh, who did Hereditary and Midsummer. Right. That dude is brilliant. He is absolutely brilliant. The way that he can do... Have you seen Hereditary? No. Okay. The way that he can do something with a camera and he just makes you feel physically ill for the situation that people are in. Right. So to me right now, my favorite, if I would had to... Uh, director... Um, is Jordan Peele. Jordan Peele is great too. Same, same us very, and very similar to Ari Aster. Yeah. Very similar style. I can't wait to see the new Candyman. Candyman was the the very first horror movies that I saw in a theater was Candy. It was a double feature, Candyman and Doctor Giggles. <laughs> it was like a there was a theater you know about an hour away from where I lived that that did double features for five dollars. And so me and my friend, you know, I think we were 16 at the time. And we went and saw that. 
and Candyman just has always been one of my favorites of the all time. But back to the to my all time favorite horror movie, Cabin in the Woods. Cabin in the Woods is great. But I'm I'm all Josh Whedon brilliant. like obsessed with Josh Whedon, so him and yeah, Drew Goddard. Cabin, Cabin in the Woods I thought was so the twists and turns that that movie took you on to the, how it ended, the, the, like, that was just so it's a crazy. perfect mix of everything. Comedy, yeah. horror, uh, I mean, and everything is done so perfect. And I think it would have been so much bigger if it wasn't for the MGM bankruptcy. It's set on a shelf during the whole bankruptcy for, like, three years and was never released. And we also even have some bad luck with some stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and so, you know, but so with all this said, um, this month's autograph will be horror themed. Ooh. Uh, well, it's a combination of supernatural horror theme. So are we actually calling it a horror supernatural movie? Yeah, it's it's definitely both. Okay. This there's the, right. this one is no ambiguity. I mean, it is, it's a horror genre with sup, uh, uh, supernatural um, beings, whatever. I, I'm I'm in for it. I like that. And so the, everybody uh, who signed up this month will get that autograph from this actress. Okay. And uh, we will go ahead and announce. I had sent out an email earlier, but there will be an add-on variant. This actress was in one episode of Supernatural, which, I mean, could be said about any actress. But <laughs> after 16 so now, years... So now you're... See, now you're just going to confuse... Because last, last month, you had to do such a hard job of making sure to not... Uh, to, to make sure that people understood that it was a Supernatural show, right. not... Supernatural. Well, that's why if you look where your head normally is. Oh yeah, there you go. It, also, it has a supernatural logo. Okay. It says fem female supernatural August variant featured in one episode. And you've got the you've got the symbol, the yep. the, uh, the tattoo symbol. Yep. And so, um, like I said, she only did one episode, but I know that a lot of people are big fans of Supernatural. So that way, if they want to get this uh, variant, uh, they can. Um, it gives if it's them. An, you know what? If it's an important episode, even just being in one, it's an important it, episode. So. I, I'll tell you this: it's definitely in my top ten episodes. That's awesome. And that's why I was actually a little bit uh, thrilled to work with this actress. Um, and we're gonna do the signing this weekend. Okay. And. Um, and so uh, I'm excited. Um, but yeah, so that is the information on this month's autographs. So All right. There we go. And so that's why I wanted to have that debate. Time. Go ahead. One variant this time, Supernatural. Actually Supernatural. Actually Supernatural. All right, I'm in for it. And... So there, we touch base on that. We touch base on the collector. We touch base on the whore. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I think we did pretty pretty good this episode. Yeah, uh, no, I think we covered a whole bunch. Yeah, I, I just, uh, I, and if anybody out there wants to know that's watching this, Kendall's favorite scary movie, even though she hates it, is Insidious. See, I just, I haven't watched, I, I, I'm not sure, I might have watched it, but I probably haven't. That's the one with the red-faced demon. Yeah. Man. So, Insidious did some cool, th so again, you know I've got like this, like, passion for directors and things that they do in movies. And so, Insidious did a couple of really cool things. So, like, the demon in Insidious has like this almost Darth Maul-looking face, red and black. Um, and, but they, they applied the red makeup is lipstick and it's applied like kind of like a crazy person would apply it on their face right to kind of give you like this like uneasy feeling and then there's a second demon which is the woman in black and the woman in black is actually played by a man dressed as a woman 
So again, it's just those things to make your mind like this doesn't look natural. Something's off. Right. Um, and Ros- just messes with you. Roswell did a good, this season of Roswell, they had, um, I guess the first trans gender actor playing a transgender, okay. but they don't talk about it on the show. Like, you know how like everybody always has to make like this person is gay, like flashing lights, you know what I mean? Or this person is obviously transgendered, right? They yeah. they actually never refer to her being transgendered the entire show, that this whole season. So it just was a. a it was just an actor playing a transgender actor, just an actor. You know what I mean? And you know, like, but like I said, they didn't make a big deal about it. They didn't say like, oh, or have somebody walk up to a person, and like, you're transgender. You know, yeah, like yeah. to point it out, like they did nothing. Like it was, which I thought was pretty impressive because. Like I said, every show always wants to, you know, sit there and say this person is gay and have and then do jokes or or comments or something about it, right? Make it part of the storyline. There was not yeah. one storyline, one comment. I think towards the end of the the, the season, like because the person's talking about changing identities to escape, you know, this or that, and they did say they've you know had enough of changing identities or something. But so I like think, a little little subtle. Yeah, like I think other than that, it was just. You know, and I think they did a pretty good job of that. Um, Autograph dude in the in the comments says this is his first month and he's looking forward to this. So perfect. I'm glad you signed up. Yeah, um, welcome. And this will be our uh, technically our fourth month because um, we got the May one filled in. But yeah, this will be our fourth, and so far everything for twenty dollars, man, it's been a hell of a ride. Um, it's been fun. So, so I'm looking forward to this one. So let me ask you this movie then. Horror or supernatural or a combination of okay. The Shining. Oh, The Shining is a supernatural horror. It's like the definition of supernatural horror. But what makes it horror? The well, you wanted to talk about somebody trying to kill somebody. Right. Is that but so is that the, the definition of horror then? I think I think that you can you could say there is one horror movie scene that is more famous than Jack Nicholson bursting through the door in the bathroom. Right. And the one that I would say is more famous than that is Michael Myers bursting through the closet door. Right. But but he's doing it because he's crazy and he's kind of being, you know, driven by these ghosts or whatever spirits and stuff to yeah. like this this energy right so at the same time i mean is it is just the fact that so if there's no supernatural tones right and it's just a just a crazy guy chasing down and trying to kill a family is that more than absolutely okay so so that then settles it i think i think for anything to be considered horror, there has to be people chasing somebody down to kill them. <laughs> there, there has to be some element. So, like, here's where, where we talk about, we were talking about signs. Right. Signs was terrifying and never had a scene like that, ever. The closest it had was the alien reaching under the, the pantry door. Right. But and the- even, like... That that wasn't scary. Like the things that were scary in signs is when all of a sudden there's a damn alien outside the bedroom window. Like that was terrifying. Or the the noises above your head in the mo- middle of the yeah. movie theater. Or the the reflection in the damn TV. Like yeah. those things were so scary, and that movie was so intense. And but it, I don't think it's a horror movie yeah, at all. Some people sit there and well, yeah, I considered that one sci-fi. Yeah. Uh, there's people that really hated on that movie, and I never understood the hate on that movie. There's, so I, I always like to tell people, Signs has nothing to do with aliens. It is a movie about faith and religion that is driven by aliens. See, to me, one of the, the other... Like, I talked about Candyman, right? One of my yeah. first experiences with a horror genre, I was, I'm going to say, eight years old. Right. And my cousins were visiting. They're about four years older than me, maybe okay. five, six years older. And we went to the video store to rent some movies. And my mom said they could pick one and I could pick one. 
Well, of course, I pick, you know, Transformers the Animated Series, or movie. Because <laughs> at the time, it just came out, you know. And yeah. then that's just a mind, them killing, you know, Optimus. And you're like, what the hell? You know. Um, and then they rented The Thing. <laughs> John Carpenter's The Thing. That was a terrifying movie. And so to go from watching Transformers to then later that night watching The Thing, whew. Just a different kind of Transformer, though. Right. And so... so there's, there's, a, there's a connecting theme between those movies. <laughs> but yeah, that was my first, uh, I think, aside from... And then later on after that, I think the next one was uh, Jason Takes Manhattan. You know, and I was probably like nine... And I'm watching it like my I was staying the night at a friend's house and we and they were watching it and I'm in the kitchen like which a little bit further away kind of watching it through my fingers you know. <laughs> I watched when I was really young. I was staying at my my dad's boss's house, and I don't remember why I was staying over there, but they watched Terminator Two: Judgment Day. Right. And I was young. I mean, I was, like, really young, and that was terrifying. Was that horror? Oh, you got somebody chasing you to kill you, but I don't feel that's a horror movie, so that right. breaks your uh, right. your rule. Firestarter. Yeah, Firestarter and Poltergeist, I think, were in that range, too, if I remember. See, Poltergeist. Is Poltergeist horror? Yeah. I don't know. I, would, I haven't been so long since I've seen it, but I was scared to hell. <laughs> It's terrifying, but is it horror? See, that, I, to me, automatically, I think that it's horror. I don't know, without even really remembering the movie all that much. I mean, there's definitely some scary moments that happen, but Poltergeist is pretty, this house pretty much is clean. It's Ghostbusters without the people that contain the issue. <laughs> right. Well, you have the little old lady, right? The what? This house is clean. So, like, what oh, yeah, it this like? house is clean. But that was a whole Indian burial ground situation, you know. Yeah, hundred percent supernatural. I guess you could say horror. Yeah. Movie. Well, see, so. the, you know, a movie that did get a lot of hate, and I liked it. I, maybe because I saw the director's cut, or maybe it wasn't. But the uh, uh, Doctor Sleep. Did you end up watching that? I haven't watched it yet. I need to watch it. Um, I actually really enjoyed yeah, I've heard, it. I've heard people love it, and I heard people hate it. Right. See, to me, that's the kind of supernatural that I like. Like that kind okay. of. You know what I mean? Like, um, where it's more, again, this was a Stephen King thing, right? It's more fantasy and more, you know, rather than, again, not slasher or not torture yeah. porn. You know what I mean? Like, I, I did get a kick out of it. But what was really cool was I've got this big 150 inch projector that I watch uh, 4K. Yeah. And uh, I actually uh, got the 4K version of The Shining. And okay. watch that just before, and to watch that drive up to the to the thing in 4K, up the mountains through Colorado, is just insane. Yeah, it'd be crazy. And it's just because it's, it's a big 150 inch screen. I mean, it's just you know, and watching it, they did a great job on the transfer to 4K on that. Okay, so here's a good one for you. Really good, really pushing this one. All right. Knowing the end of the movie, which I assume that you do, or even the show, back when it was a made-for-TV movie, is it sci-fi? It. Is it a sci-fi movie? Yes. It's a combination of. So there you go. It, you know, you got your... But then we Again, get... It's so hard to classify things just... I, I think that there's no other genre than horror that has so many uh, initials after it, like a accomplished doctor. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing is, is you know, when I did the, uh, the Ivana whatever from... Uh, from um, uh, the Ivana broke from... Um, Pan's Labyrinth, Pan? right? Yeah. I said that this was she was a lead in a horror, right? But then again, yeah. I think I got some flashback that that movie wasn't a horror movie. That see, that's a good one. Is that that's a? I would classify that first as fantasy, right? With 
horror subgenre. Right. So it's it's like fantasy first, then horror. So it's like to me, horror is if such you were a huge not terrified category. Terrified of the pale man. Right. I don't know who you are. Or even you know the Nazi dude from you know the, or the, the Spanish. Or the main bad guy. Right. The main guy. He was terrifying, especially when he got his face cut. Yeah. Spoilers for people. That guy's terrifying. Well, I mean, I guess the movie's been out twenty some years, so it or feels like it. I guess spoilers are. But well, it's funny because when you asked about it, right? The first yeah. movie just before you said that, the next movie I was going to bring up would be uh, Serenity. Okay. Right, because you've got the Reavers, right? It's yeah. sci-fi and the Reavers. You know, that's pretty hardcore horror. I mean, then especially the, the way they do a lot of jump cuts and. You know, it's. I mean, a lot of sci-fi. I think crosses over. I mean, look at Pitch Black. Oh, Pitch Black, yeah. Well, that Pitch Black was so big because Pitch Black, I feel like, was marketed as a horror film, and then the Chronicles of Riddick was action, right. sci-fi, fantasy. Yeah. So you had this like horror film that kind of jumped the shark to another genre completely. And I liked the mythology on the Chronicles of Riddick stuff. I would have loved to have seen a lot more stuff in that world, in that universe. I played those games. The games on Xbox, the Riddick games, were so fun. It was just so cool to walk around being Riddick. Like, I'm sad that that character hasn't come back again. I thought he was great. Right. What's amazing, too, go back to, like, this this, this, uh, horror genre, right? Video games, I think, is perfect for the horror genre. And Silent Hill, to this day, will always be one of my favorite games. And I, did you ever play the original Silent Hill? I was terrified. You had a flashlight. You had a flashlight with the noise, with the crackling, you know, so you could hear when monsters were getting near. Yeah. And then not one of the scenes that, that I remember to this day, right? I, I could tell you a little bit about the game here and there and the story overall. But when you go to the school, right, for the first time. You make your way to the school. Your daughter's missing, right? You you walk into one room. The phone rings, and it's like a conference room or whatever. You pick it up, and she's screaming, "Daddy, help me! Help me! Help me!" Right? And then it, like you hear a bunch of stuff, and it hangs up. And then you walk into the locker room, right? And the locker room is shaped like you walk down, and it's almost like a sideways U. And all you hear is this. And it's like yeah. something trying to get out of a locker, right? And then you round the corner, right? And you see uh, a locker, and it's kind of moving with the banging, right? So you get close, and you're just waiting for something to jump out at you, right? And about three or four steps before you get to that locker, another locker opens, right? And a body like fall, or uh, a or a cat jumps out. No, yeah. that's what it is. The cat jumps out at you, as you and you, you like sigh, and then it runs off. You hear it run off, and then all of a sudden you hear this crunch, crunch, crunch of it getting eaten. Oh my! Yeah, yeah. I, uh... Like to to me to this day, that game was just intense. And then you go up that clock, the 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 school tower, and you come back down, and everything's like straight out of Hellraiser, like bodies yeah. chained to the, the the all of the walls. You know, and it, like all the walls are now like uh, fences, like you're chain link fences with blood and got hanging from them, like the entire like, have, underworld. Uh, do you have VR? The what? Do you have VR? Oh, I don't. My brother-in-law, they have it and stuff like that. But I have a, I have PlayStation VR, and I will tell you, Resident there Evil is 7? something, there is something messed up about actually having to look yeah. and not being able to hold the controller and just turn the screen mm-hmm. it messes with, so I have um, for PlayStation VR I have Paranormal Activity which is a game they made for it and I love the Paranormal Activity movies I think you want to talk about supernatural horror that's like oh, the, sure. next, the best right. supernatural or, or uh uh, Paranormal Activity is the best supernatural horror I think out there. It's just so terrifying. That first movie, I literally could feel every time that it was nighttime and they were recording, 
my heart rate went through the roof. That was like the sequels to the uh, Blair Witch thing, right? Kind of. It was like, what can we do with this idea of found footage? Right. And they created, and there were so much, so like the first one, have you seen any of them? I don't think so. So the first one is all just filming their bedroom basically at night. And for 90% of the movie, barely anything happens. Like a door might move a little bit. Some sheets might ruffle a little bit. But it was just watching. And they had like the little, the time was like speeding up and then it would stop and it would slow down. And you'd be like looking everywhere on the screen for like, oh my God, what's happening? And then it would speed up again. And my heart went through the roof every night. Like, it was the most terrifying experience. So, of course, this game comes out for VR, and I'm like, oh, hell yeah. I buy it. Same thing as Silent Hill. You have a flashlight. That is all you have is a flashlight. And you go into the Paranormal Activity house. And so the first time I'm playing this game, I'm alone at, at home, and I've got the VR headset on, and I walk into the house. I walk down a hallway I go into the first room that I enter, and I you you know you have to open the door. I walk in, and in front of me is a dresser, and I open the dresser and I look inside, and the door behind me closes. So I'm like, oh that's cool, you know it's probably just a game mechanic. The door closes, and so I go to pick up something, and the door opens behind me, and I can hear the door behind me open, and I just took the headset off, and I was like, nope, I'm not going to turn around, like. <laughs> The idea that I would have to actually turn around to look was the most scary thing I faced in the video game ever. And see, that's where I think with video games, knock it out of the park is with sound. Same with like yeah, the, the, with uh, science. Like that was why I loved science, and that's why I like like the Jordan Peele stuff because what he does with sound. And uh, VR, like my nephews are obsessed with those Five Nights at Freddy games. Oh yeah, and there's that VR one. It's it yeah exactly. Well, Resident Evil Seven, which is you know the Resident Evil movies went in a weird direction. You know now they're doing like, what what is that the, the Chainsaw Texas Massacre like family style stuff, where it's yeah. like a mansion and it's like the family and they're all like cannibals and you're trying yeah, to. I, I play I played all of Resident Evil Seven. Um, I loved it. I thought did it was you play great. it in VR? Absolutely, I did. And and so like. There's, it was terrifying. Yeah, my brother-in-law, he buys two VR setups on every new one that comes out. He buys, and they they just he lo he's obsessed with VR. Um, it's VR is VR and horror are meant for each other. Yeah. I know that there's other great VR experiences out there. It's meant for horror, honestly. Um, somebody, I know that they exist in like some of the bigger cities. But those um, VR experiences now, where you basically are put into a room with a VR headset and you go through a haunted house. Um, yeah, augmented reality is. I love. See, I'm a bigger fan of augmented reality. Okay, that's a good one too. Yeah. Yeah, like especially like, could you imagine like a Ghostbuster or Paranormal Activity with you know, where AR where you're just looking at your house and all of a sudden your house is the setting. And then, like, There's actually a terrifying uh, mobile game for Apple that is augmented reality in your house. Right. And um, you kind of just like walk around and listen and you have to put headphones in. So it does the same thing you're talking about with sound where it makes you hear something behind you. And the only thing you can see is in your phone is where you can see where things are. Right. Yeah, it's just, you know, I can't wait for some of the technology stuff. Like, I was playing uh, The Last of Us, right? Part yeah. two. And the whole time I'm playing this, I'm like, they just need to take this engine and remake Silent Hill with it. You know, because that's the problem when you go back to try to play those old Resident Evil games or the Silent Hill games. Any game, actually, pretty much, is, it's so stiff. Well, you're familiar with um, PT, right? PT. The the playable trailer that came out for the Silent Hill game that was supposed to be coming out that never got made. No. And if you look, go go to YouTube and look up PT playthrough. PT. It it was terrifying, and it was supposed to be the next Silent. It was supposed to be called Silent Hills, 
Right. And um, it actually starred Norman Reedus okay. in the play- playable trailer. Yeah. And it was uh, it was terrifying, and it got scrapped. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm I'm excited for uh, the reviews I've been watching for a Ghost of um, uh, Tsunami. Right? Oh, yeah. Uh, a lot of people are saying not only is it uh, a top PlayStation game of all time, but it's top 10, top 20 game of all time. Like, That's when you crazy. sit there and start having conversations like, you know, Mario 64 and, uh, you know, Zelda, you know, uh, Mask, you know, all this, that this game is going to be in that conversation. That's crazy. So I'm excited to play. I just need to finish uh, Last of Us Part Two. And right now, I just between doing all, all the autograph of the month stuff, two fifty eight stuff, this my cryptocurrency, you know, company, the crypto company, just haven't had a lot of time to sit down and you know play. I but, haven't played games in so long, and I miss it. What's your top game of all time? I would have to say Silent Hill. If I was this in Last of Us, um, see for me, for me, for me, it's pretty, it's Ocarina of Time. See, I never really got... I never played it. I really? wanted to. Like, I played the original Zelda. It's just... What happened was, is... Um, it came out... It was, what, the GameCube? Yeah. See, I never For, owned the uh, GameCube. No, Ocarina of Time was N64. Really? Because I played a lot of the Zelda, ge- or the Zelda games on N64, but I didn't play that one. I don't yeah, Ocarina, Ocarina of Time and... Um... Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask were in 64 games originally. Really? I thought you could have swore they were GameCube. No, GameCube was... Because I had it in 64. They remade, see, they remade Ocarina of Time a bunch, but the original Ocarina of Time and the original Majora's Mask were N64. Right. See, um... Yeah, because I never owned the GameCube, and I, you know, went away from Nintendo, you know, and it was more PlayStation, Xbox, because Nintendo was fine. Like with the Wii, you, I owned it, played it for like a month, and then never played it again. <laughs> Same thing with like, uh, like I have a, a Switch, um, Lite, and I played uh, Animal Crossing for like a month and haven't played it again. <laughs> Like, I still think, like, Nintendo does, like, such a good job of this, like, innovative technology. Like, the Wii. Like, the Wii was, like, next level. Like, immersive. But yeah, they're so... For a month. But they're, they're... The problem with Nintendo is they are the apple of game systems. Right. They don't let anybody in. Yeah. And uh, they don't want to jump, you know, you know, like... To me, I always thought Nintendo's best move was to... Work on other systems. Uh, Autograph, you helped me out. Wind Waker was GameCube. That was the one that was GameCube. And then I remember that they came out with... Uh, Autograph, you can correct me, but I'm pretty sure they came out with... Uh, Twilight Princess was GameCube and Wii. I think. They, they released it both. See, my problem with console was that uh, come about 1997, 98... I was all PC Chronicles or um, Ultima Online. You know, Ultima Online took up three years of my life. And I literally woke up and I'm just about to uh, turn 21. And I was like, crap, what is, what have I done the last three years of my life? I leveled a level fi- monk to level 50 and nothing <laughs> else. <laughs> That was, I was, do you, did you ever play EverQuest? But yeah, uh, that, that was EverQuest, but, uh, sorry, Ultima Online, I played for like a little bit, and it led to EverQuest, sorry. Yeah, Ever, that was me, EverQuest, I... I was an so Iskar funny. Monk level I 50, lost, three years. I lost so much of my life to EverQuest. Yep. It was the coolest thing ever. I went back and I looked at my, my, because I only played one character, and, uh, I didn't ever cared about leveling. I loved leading guilds, running guilds. I ran um, a guild, and I loved going to places I was told I couldn't go. Like, <laughs> fear. And, like, I would lead raids in fear at level 50. Right? 
And uh, I died so much that I just never leveled. Right? Yeah. And I would love, because I love that feel Because remember we were talking about the horror, that feeling in games, right? So in EverQuest, I loved going to a dungeon or a place or a zone that I've never been. And being the, the uh, I was an Iskar monk with feigned death, so I'd pull all of the mobs back to the guild. Right? Yeah. So I would go around the corner not knowing what was going to be there. You know, my heart's pounding, I'm sweating. You know, because if I screw up, I'm letting, you know, it takes like an hour for everybody, you know, everybody gets wiped and you have to like restart and get yeah, everybody yeah, yeah. and resurrect everybody and whatever. And so there's like a lot on the line. And, you know, in that feeling of not knowing what's around the corner or if I'm going to kill everybody, get everybody dead, you know, was a real feeling. Like it was, yeah. you know, and I, I just loved it. And I went back and I had 159 days played on my character. And they don't count it as like I just played 159 days. That means no, that's a, hour like they log 20 minutes. They'll log 20 minutes. Yeah, on that no, that's 159 times 24 hours. Times 60. <laughs> yeah, and, that's. Uh... And I never played any other characters. I never did anything. It was Shaolin Super Show. Right, because I was obsessed. My first website was Wu Tang Clan, web fan page. <laughs> And, and uh, Ultima Online, my character's name was Old Dirty Bastard. Oh, my God. And the guild was, uh, the colors were yellow and black. There you go. And, you know, so, uh, you know, I, it's funny because that was like in 1997, I think, with when I, or 96. When the internet was still, like, even AOL didn't have an internet yet. Like, internet, AOL had its own private closed off internet. Like, it wasn't, like, a public... I had to go to Portland to, like, some uh, place above a strip mall <laughs> to get, like, a phone number. And I had to pay the guy, like, $25 cash to get access to a phone number so that I could plug in my 56K modem to dial a number to get online, <laughs> you know, yep. to actually... And then I, you know, for my, was it 16th or 17th birthday, I uh, asked my mom for a, a HTML... Uh, building kit that teaches you HTML because huh. me, me and my friend were uh, it was an apartment complex and we were in, in at the gym just it was where we hung out you know yeah. uh, the little wor workout room for the, the apartment complex and there was a guy working out we were talking about we wanted to start our own magazine you know hot cars and women and blah 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 you know basically Maxim <laughs> And the guy, you know, because again, this is Portland, so this is you know, Tektronics, you know, a lot of the, of the the IT stuff was going on, you know, around. And the guy's like, you know, what you guys should do is just do a website. We're like, what's a website? Oh gosh. <laughs> and so that's when we started doing it. We like kept using our parents' credit cards to get the the AOL, you know, the AOL disc came in every single magazine. And yep. so we had like we'd get that, and then we'd sign up to like. Like how how do we get to an actual web page? And you couldn't through AOL. Like I said, it was it was completely closed. It was only their little groups and their little like forums and whatever. And it just drove us down. Like how do we get to this world wide web? That's so funny. You know, and 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 that's again that's where I'm at with my crypto company right now. Like we're at that level. Like the third generation blockchain. Cardano, it launches next Wednesday. Um, yeah, it's crazy. And we're going to be operating two pools. And, and this is like world-changing technology and stuff. And um, this is stuff that, you know, if you go back and, like, watch the videos from that time, and everybody's like, online world, it's only for porn and scams. And that's sort of like Bitcoin. <laughs> and everybody's like, it's only for porn and scams and, you know, money laundering. Like, and it's not. Like, there's going to be world-saving you know, everything on these systems and it's complete platforms. And, and so it's funny to be able to have lived through the early days of the internet like that, and then also be on the pioneering end of the crypto stuff. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. And so it, it's, I don't know, you're, I don't know how old you are, I'm, but I'm like 41. So it's like, to me, I graduated, it was like 97. You know, and so it was, it was an odd time because, like I said, at the time there was internet, but it wasn't, you know, it was still brand new. And 
you know. I, I grew up. I grew up in the AOL. We were talking about it before. Actually, funny, funny story about AOL. My uh, my dad. I'm talking to him like last week or so, and he goes, "You're talking shit about me online." <laughs> and I go, "What do you mean?" And he's like, "You're talking about me and my AOL and how I still have AOL." <laughs> so he like tuned in to one of these videos, saw saw us talking about AOL. And um, but the good news is he he uh, finally got a hold of him. He said he asked him. He goes, "Is it true I can keep my email and stop paying you?" And they're like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Then I'm not gonna pay you anymore." <laughs> so we just saved him five bucks a month. Yeah, we just saved him money. So that's what this show does. We save people money with with uh, good good advice. Don't pay for AOL. All right. Well, that was the same thing with the crypto, right? Like today, um, they just passed uh, like one of the courts said that banks can now be custodial holders of people's crypto and tokens and all that kind of stuff. And then a lot of people were like, well, that kind of defeats the whole purpose of, you know, crypto. being decentralized is if if you're holding on to it. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And we can use this any way we want. But at the same time, there's still people that use paper checks. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's great for onboarding people who are new to the new to it right and for those who want to be in the DeFi space can be in the DeFi space but if you just want to be an investor or or a speculator or whatever you can as well like just like the internet uh with the the crypto the blockchain you can use it for whatever you want yeah and however you want and so uh, anything that brings more people to it is a good thing yeah you know? absolutely I mean, things can be, it's a whole debate in all the different movies and TV shows. Things can be used for good or evil. You know what I mean? It's, yeah, like Twitter. <laughs> and it's funny, actually, the, the, the founder of Cardano actually tweeted, because yeah. one of the projects that uh, is being launched on Cardano is the PRISM project, okay. which is a, a digital ID. So basically, you have a digital ID, and no matter where you go in the world, you can have access to your medical records, um, to your school records, um, in any country, anywhere in the world, even on Mars, if we went to Mars, all tied to your digital ID. And, and there was a helicopter on Mars this, this week. There you go. And and so he, he tweeted out, you know... Uh, to Twitter, because Twitter has, you know, the problem with bots and people. And the good thing about digital IDs is you can uh, link things to, like, one account. You know how, like, right now, a lot of times we link our phone numbers or something to it. But you can stop a lot of the bullying and a lot of the, the impersonation, a lot of the bots by, by um, linking these digital IDs directly to an account. Um, and so he actually tweeted, you know, about the prison project and even tweeted uh, Jack Dorsey. It's like, hey, look, he goes, I will institute the prison project on uh, Twitter for free or at cost, <laughs> you know, and stop a lot of these, you know, these. The, uh, future, the future of the blue verified check mark. Well, that was the problem. You Did you hear what happened last week or earlier this week when all of the, the, the accounts, the verified ones all got hacked? Yeah. At the same time, it all tweeted some Bitcoin scam. You know, oh, yeah. Elon. All you have to do go go look at go look at any post that Elon Musk does and look at the comments, and it's full of scams. Right, and same thing with like one of the biggest things. Is, and again, any any there's scams. I mean, I still get phone calls of people trying to scam me every day. I mean, you mean your social security number has been yeah. compromised? Yeah, like or you know, do the, you you know? Anyways, so I mean, the phone, you know, by mail, like I get scam stuff yeah. everywhere. You know, I mean, and uh, but yeah, like. All of the major people uh, uh, on Twitter that had verified check marks all got their accounts hacked and all tweeted out uh, these Bitcoin scams from verified users. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it just shows you that nobody is safe on that. Like, you have to, like, double check, double check everything. I think it was just, like, two weeks ago, a bunch of people who were verified but stopped using Twitter like old accounts that had been verified and hadn't had a tweet for like five years. Right. Those got hacked too. 
Yeah, what so it is is, I mean, right now there's a lot of Bitcoin scams and other crypto scams on YouTube where the hackers will hack somebody's Google account, mm -hmm. change the name, change it to make it look like it's Apple or make it look like it's Microsoft, make it look like it's an exchange, and then do a live stream with like 40,000 bots watching and saying like, hey, send us uh, one Bitcoin, we'll send you two. And it's only during this live stream just to get you used to using it, right? Yeah. And people fall for it because they say, hey, there's 40,000 people watching. But if you start following the links and actually look into it, it's it's it dead ends and it's just a scam. You know? And again, that's what they do is they hack these accounts. And it's funny because the founder of Cardano, right? The, because Cardano has been blowing up the crypto projects that I'm working on, you know? Have been blowing yeah. up. It's, it's like... Uh, six x in the last couple months it went from like three cents up to like now it's at 13. and so it's been getting a lot of attention so scammers are starting to to use his uh speeches and his whiteboards and stuff so much so that there was a like a pootie pie type youtuber in um in uh oh, what country was it it was like uh the czech republic or something right yeah. And he was like a big time streamer. And his account got hacked. They rebanded it as Charles Hodgkinson's account with him doing his speeches. <laughs> so much, oh, it was a Serbian, Serbian streamer. So much so that all of the Serbians started uh, attacking his real account, said, threatening, and he even got messages from the Serbian mob threatening oh that if God. he didn't return the account, because they actually thought it was him. They thought he took the account. Oh he God. thought that he hacked it, and he was, a, and he actually was getting death threats from the Serbian mob. You know, uh, and he's like, "Dude, this is not me. I would, you know, the, they're using this. These are scammers. You know, like these. Are, yeah. Your account was hacked. It has nothing to do with me, other than they're just using my name to to make this a thing." That's crazy. All right, so you can ask me one question, and then we'll call it a night. What do you want to? Oof. Is there okay? So we've got. I think we should recap real quick. So we've got an actress from a supernatural horror movie. Right. Is the main autograph yeah. that everybody will get this month. The that's the one everybody's getting, and the variant is that she was in one episode of Supernatural. Right. And so this is a, a, a signed photo from her in Supernatural is the variant. So, okay, so I know obviously being in one episode of Supernatural, she wasn't a lead. Is she, was she a lead in the Supernatural horror movie? This is a tough one, right? Because in my mind, yes. Okay. Because it was more of an on Like, there was five pe like, three people that were in a majority of the movie together. Okay. And she's okay. one of the three. Okay. But then again, and it, and it was part of a series, right? But this series, this cast, wasn't really in any of the other movies. Okay. So, but, but, but it was tied, like, the people from the other movies do show up, and they're in it for a little bit, so that's why you can't really say, I mean... But again, she is going to be one of the people that did have a majority of the time in the movie. All right. Like, Don't it, say too much. People are going to start researching like crazy. Right. Like I said, it's if they're still watching, we have you know three people right now. So, but uh, I'm glad I had fun. I like this. We'll pretty soon. We'll hopefully we'll get more and more people. And we'll see if we can yeah. simulcast it on the Facebook pages and YouTube and whatnot. But I, I just think the quality is so much better on YouTube than it is on Facebook. Yeah. 